Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. So pleased to be here with you tonight and really excited about this event. We are going to meet three artists who are doing incredibly impressive and inspiring work at the intersection of art and activism having to do with ocean pollution. They are Pam Longobardi, Alejandro Duran, and Aurora Robeson. Each of them makes art from plastic trash found in the oceans, and they've all created organizations or projects or initiatives that involve others in cleaning up the oceans or intercepting the waste stream before it gets to the oceans. They've admired each other's work for years, but never actually met and directly connected with each other until now. And so we have another artist to thank for this, and that's Andy Yoder, a sculptor based in Washington, D.C., whose installation called Overboard is on view at the Brattleboro Museum through March 6th. Overboard has been written up in the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and many other publications around the world. It was inspired by an incident in 1990 where 61,000 Nike Air Jordan 5 sneakers spilled off a container ship into the ocean. And so the project engages with the question of how our consumer habits are affecting the oceans. That's not the only issue embedded in Andy's installation, but it's a big one. And that being the case, we thought it would be instructive to hear from these other great artists who are also dealing with that issue. So the way this is gonna work this evening is that in just a moment, I will leave the screen and each of our guest artists will come on in succession and give about a 10 minute presentation or so about their work. First, we'll hear from Pam Longobardi then Alejandro Duran, and then Aurora Robeson. When Aurora is finished, Pam and Alejandro will come back on, and they'll be joined by Andy Yoder, who will lead the group in a conversation about their art and activism. And after that, we're going to open it up uh, for a Q&A with all of you, so I hope you'll stick around and participate. If there are questions or comments that occur to you before we get to the Q&A, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type them in, and then we'll get to them during the actual Q&A. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can just use the comment feature there, and we'll keep an eye on that too. Okay, um, before I bring on Pam, I just wanna give you some very brief background on each of our speakers. Pam Longobardi is a multidisciplinary artist and eco-feminist living and working in Atlanta, where she's the Distinguished University Professor of Art at Georgia State. She's the founder of the Drifters Project, a global collaborative entity that has removed tens of thousands of pounds of trash from the natural environment and resituated it in social space. Alejandro Duran, based in Mexico and Brooklyn, collects trash on the Caribbean coast of Mexico and transforms it through an ongoing environmental installation and photography project called Washed Up, Transforming a Trashed Landscape, which is designed to raise awareness about plastic pollution. He also engages audiences through community-based environmental art making. And Aurora Robeson is a multimedia artist who grew up in Hawaii and now lives in New York's Hudson Valley. Aurora is known for her meditative work created from material she has intercepted from the plastic waste stream. She's the founder of Project Vortex, an international collective of artists, designers, and architects who work in innovative ways with plastic debris. Finally, Andy Yoder is originally from Cleveland and now based in Washington, D.C. Andy's a sculptor who often works with repurposed everyday objects as a way of exploring ideas about order and organization and the way humans interact with their constructed environment. Okay, with all that housekeeping out of the way, I'm going to ask Pam Longobardi to turn on her camera and mic and get us underway. Pam? 
Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank Hi. you. Hi. It's such a pleasure to be here, and we uh, really appreciate the Brattleboro Museum and Danny and Andy for inviting the three of us. Um, we've been in shows together before, but never have actually met in person. So this is uh, the closest we can get right now. <laughs> I'm going to start with the film. Just a, a, it's a kind of a chop cut from a longer film, um, and then I'll pop on for a few more slides. sharing your screen. Oh, thank you. Well, I was just going to mention that. It sounded great, but we were <laughs> seeing your screen. Here we go. Wait, one second. Okay. swimming and I said, what's around the edge? Suddenly I saw two huge caves and from the water, because I look for plastic, I see it everywhere. I could see that there was an enormous amount of plastic in that cave. And we got inside the cave and the plastic in there was huge. There were life rings from giant ocean liners. There were styrofoam blocks that were the size of a refrigerator bundled with colored ropes. So these were some kind of, you know, handmade fishing bumper. The second thing I realized was that everything was coated in this bright colored yellow ochre dust. It looked like it was all rocks. I, I saw something sticking out, I picked it up, and the dust fell away immediately, and I realized that the bottom of the cave was filled with styrofoam. And then I started to see more and more things. There were shoes, there were water bottles, there were giant high-density polyethylene jugs. An extreme amount of physical labor, and the effort that that took just was, you know, the smallest drop in the bucket of trying to sort of undo the magnitude of the damage we've done. After we swam the half mile into the cave, tied the bundle out of the camera's view, and then this thing that was so big and so heavy inside of the cave that we could barely lift the three of us to get it over the rocks without breaking the bags and spilling the plastic back into the sea again as the tide was coming up, as the waves were starting to crash. As soon as we tied it in a bundle and swam it around the corner, it just disappeared almost into a pinprick of nothing. The plastic island we had created in that time just kind of got lost in the immensity of nature. And so to me, that was the biggest symbol of this. Nature is bigger than us. It's more powerful. We are in a point of our evolution as species, creatures, earthlings. 
inhabitants of this planet, where it's sort of a turning point. We're either, you know, going to take ourselves down, and sadly for me, the most sad part is we're going to take down a lot of amazing and beautiful other life forms with us. Nature's going to be fine. It's immensely powerful. It's immensely creative. It's going to twist and turn itself into something new. But what are we doing with our time? What are what is our last moments? So that was just a little clip from a, um, a 30 minute film um, that I made with my collaborators um, on the island of Catalonia in Greece. And uh, as you can tell, the ocean is where my heart is. Um, my dad was an ocean lifeguard and he all, uh, also worked for uh, Union Carbide. And so I was born into the world of plastic. I literally was, um, a child when it switched over, I can remember that, uh, getting milk in milk bottles. And this is this, um, from the 50s, a, a illustration in Life magazine where, you know, all of the land was now these different types of plastic and, you know, kind of performing uh, the same function as uh, a landmass that we were doing in the um, film. So I want to bring you back to the beginning of it for me, which was in 2005. Um, this is the south point of the Big Island. Um, this is what I saw the first time I went to that very tip. And it just hit me over the head like a ton of bricks. I realized that this literally was our garbage that was being vomited out of the ocean. And it was coming from all over the world. And I, at that moment, just decided that I was going to change everything that I was doing with my artwork. And I started to work with this material, um, first with the nets. And I made some very large um, drift webs, I called them. This was one for a show in Monaco that I did um, in 2011. And other large scale sculptures. Um, this was from uh, a response really to the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Uh, where you know all of the the oil was spilling out of the BP pipes because we really didn't know what we were doing down there, and this is what I'm talking about in the film text where you know we're kind of running to the last bits parts of the earth where we can find oil and and taking this material out only to lock it up in this in plastic. So um, this is also uh, kind of about the 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 pilfering of the bounty of, of uh, nature, essentially, and um, perhaps not paying attention to the fact that we do share the world with so many other creatures. Um, another piece that was directly in response to the BP oil spill um, was the crime of willful neglect. Um, this actually is assembled on the wall. It has over 500 pieces of plastic that are from 
all over the world, essentially. After Hawaii, I started working in many, many different locations. And um, all of the floats that are in the center of this uh, exhibition were found on the um, gyre expedition that we did. So they're all from the remote parts of Alaska. And uh, I started to really understand that there's something about these objects that is telling a story. There really are the, the cultural archeology span of our time right now. And they're, they're going to be the layer in the future uh, fossil record that tells of this time, the Anthropocene that we have um, literally changed the surface of the earth with our human activities. Um, I've made pieces that have been uh, assembled for the cover of Sierra Magazine. Um, I have work in museums and I also do things that are in the field. So um, activating groups on small islands in Belize. Um, we cleaned this, this mass of plastic and then spelled out the words mass extinction with the plastic and the humans, um, just broadcasting a message that we are in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. And um, on another island, Key Cocker did a, a similar um, work with more people and more plastic. Um, I've done shows that include um, pieces that uh, were generated from my work on Lesvos, which is another Greek island um, that has seen 600,000 refugees come to it. And um, I, I saw this acreage of uh, life vests for myself and I, I was realizing that every one of them represented a single person. And so I, I went back in the winter and I worked in the refugee camps um, and they were already working with this material. So it wasn't a stretch for them. And they were actually so happy to receive. I brought sewing machines with me and I was able to leave them. This is a, a tailor from Afghanistan who hadn't seen a sewing machine in, in the year he'd been in this camp. Um, and another fellow from Iran. So we are um, working together on this flag, which um, was made to be a, a flag uh, for the new nation of refugees. Um, so if we look at the extension of um, uh, climate change and now causing human migrations as well as animal migrations. Um, and the, the beauty of this piece was that it was actually bought by um, a university uh, here in Atlanta, the Women's College of Agnes Scott. And so I was able to take thousands of dollars back and donate them to the uh, to the um, camps that I was working in in uh, Lesbos. Um, this is the most recent thing that I've just done. It's it's a very large piece of public art. It's uh, 12 feet tall and you can see um, it's got quite a bit of relief in it. And um, and so I'm just blowing it off as I have finished installing it there. And um, I want to just invite you to join me. My newest project is actually a book and I'm inviting people to find their own messages in plastic materials that you encounter. It could be on the city streets, in which case you're providing a kind of interception of that plastic before it enters the ocean, or it could be on the, the local beaches or um, wherever you live around the world. And get in touch with me. Um, I'm collecting this material because I think the ocean is literally speaking us to us through this material of our own making, through the plastic. And I'd love to hear what messages you might find. My email's right here. Um, on Instagram, I'm at Drifters Project and my website is driftersproject.net. Thank you. Now I'm gonna pass to Alejandro and he'll tell you about what he's up to. I can get this working. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to start, but let me know if uh, if it's not working. So, thank you so much for the invitation, um, Andy and Danny. And it's such an honor to be here in conversation with uh, such wonderful artists, Pam and Aurora. So, let me tell you a little bit about this project I've been working on for the past 11 years now, it's called Washed Up, Transforming a Trashed Landscape. And um, it basically arose when I went to visit um, 
Sian Khan, which is a federally protected biosphere reserve on the Caribbean coast of Mexico. We zoom in here, it's just south of Tulum. I had been to Tulum as, as a boy and have no recollection of any plastic or garbage on the beach. But when I came, went to, in 2010 to visit the area, I was blown away by the amount of garbage that was, as you can see from, from uh, Google, that it's, it's a magical location, but it was covered in plastic trash. And at first I was completely confused. It seemed like potentially locals were coming to dump their garbage there because of the sheer quantity. And then when I started to speak to some of the locals, they were like, no, this is washing ashore from all over the world every day. And so they were, they were like, check out some of the labels on the products. And so I did, and so far have documented garbage from 60 different countries on six continents, washing ashore in this paradise on the Caribbean coast of Mexico called, called Sian Can. So you can see here in red, all of the countries represented by their garbage in Mexico. And so here are some, some samples of the products. This uh, is from Gabon, a water bottle from the west coast of Africa. Uh, Jamaican water bottle, many Jamaican water bottles. Um, I find stuff from all over the world, but the majority obviously comes from countries that are in closer proximity to the coast. Water bottles are obviously a major problem. Um, found water bottles from, from all over the world. There have been books written on the topic, but uh, yeah, it, water bottles are, are a major issue with plastic pollution, especially in a place like New York, we have the most a clean, amazing drinking water. It's a scam. Also finding plenty of, of this particular product from Haiti. It's called Timalis. It's a Haitian butter that comes in all kinds of, sh all shapes and sizes. Obviously a very popular product there. But also from Europe, this is a product from France, from Italy, another product from China. And you know, one of the, the obvious ironies is that there are a lot of cleaning products. This says limpio, which in, in, uh, in Spanish means clean. And we're obviously not doing a great job to clean the beaches with these cleaning products. So a bleach from Costa Rica, a disinfectant from Guatemala, shampoo from South Korea, electric motor and equipment cleaner from Australia, toilet cleaner from Norway. Um, it's, it's absurd these cleaning products littering our beaches. People ask what's the most interesting object and still after 11 years, the most interesting object I've found is this prosthetic leg. Um, and here I am, this is soon after I started the project, just uh, having gathered a lot of the material for this work, I, I actually convinced my sister at the time to come camp out on the beach with me and we got the project underway. And here are some of the images from the photo series. So it started out as a photo series of the installations that I was making. So they were ephemeral installations on the coast, right where I found the garbage washing up. People think that I paint the garbage, but this is all the process of finding and gathering and organizing by color, the materials that I'm finding. This one has probably between 800 and 900 uh, green bottles of polyethylene uh, plastic. I removed all of the labels to sort of create more of a homogeneous look to the image. This one has some rope tangled in with the with the roots of this tree. I kind of felt like a like a hairdresser when I was when I was making this this piece. And this piece has exactly 592 PET water bottles, clear water bottles. It's called Amanecer or Dawn. And although the majority of what I'm finding is plastic, I'm also finding light bulbs intact. I have another image as well with fluorescent tubes that miraculously arrive uh, intact uh, on the shores of, of this coast. This is one of the original images that I had in mind when I started the project. And then I moved on from sort of the photo series onto these multimedia installations the key philosophical question for me when I started this project was like, okay, I've taken the photograph of these installations. What do I do with the garbage now? Um, recycling didn't seem like an option. The plastic was kind of contaminated and broken down and recyclers didn't really want it. And the landfill was not an e ecologically sound place. So finally it dawned on me, 
you know, after all of the effort to collect and organize and clean this stuff, to use it, it had a real value to continue to educate and create artworks. And in this work, you kind of broke the plane of the two dimensional photograph to create these three dimensional works and the garbage is spilling back out into our lives. You know, we throw something out, we think it's, we throw something away, but here it is the garbage coming right back uh, into our lives. And this is, this is a piece called Vena, which has had different iterations. This was in Utah, this was in Luxembourg, Connecticut, and most recently in Washington, DC at the Inter-American Development Bank. And so this piece unfortunately is growing. Um, it's, I see it as kind of a living artwork that continues to grow. I think it's important. Um, it's kind of reflective of the continuing problem of plastic that continues to, to grow. So ideally I'll run out of materials for this project, but right now that's not happening. Um, and this is an initiative I called the Museo de la Basura, which I would like to continue. It's called the Museum of Garbage, and it's basically uh, a museum I created on the coast in Mexico, the home base for this project. This is the location for it. So um, as things with the pandemic hopefully settle down, I will return here to build out this museum. Reach out if you want to get involved. I'm going to need all the help I can get. And another key component are the beach cleans and education program around the project. So the local community in Punta Allen um, has come out to support the project and help clean the beach. And here's some of the kiddos and education program we did. And this young lady wrote in this simple exercise, he asked them to just write their message to the world um, on this issue of plastic pollution. And this young lady wrote, no contaminas las playas porque contaminas a los animales. Don't contaminate the beaches because you contaminate the animals. And this young man is very simple, but such a powerful message. He wrote, tu basura, mi lugar, which means your garbage, my place. And this is, this is their home. And you know the world's garbage is just landing at their doorstep every day. So I feel it's really important to empower and give a voice to this community who it really this, this issue affects directly. And so I, I plan on continuing that work. And so some of the, the work be, uh, is also included sort of community-based art making. So this was a starfish slash sun, whatever you want to kind of see in there that we made with the, with, the, with the youth and then returned a couple of years later to make this image of planet earth with the same group of students. And um, so many stories to tell over the course of this project at this moment when we were creating this work, there was actually a rainbow around the sun and uh, I'd never seen one of those before, but I took it <laughs> as a sign that, that uh, we were doing the right thing and the right work. So it was very powerful. But, um, but yeah, please reach out. Um, my website, alejandroduran.com has a lot of information on the project and uh, I love to collaborate and, and please reach out if you'd like to, um, to get involved in any way. So I will stop sharing my screen and pass it on to Aurora. Thank you so much for listening. Hello. Um, oh no, I'm at the beginning. I mean, the end. How do I do this? How did that happen? Here we go. So, thank you. Andy and Pam for the incredible work you're doing. It's um, great to be here speaking with you and thank you to the Brattleboro Museum and Andy for inviting us. So this is a, a picture of your average trash day in New York City. Um, I grew up in Hawaii where there was very little plastic garbage. Aurora, you're not sharing. Oh no, thank you. <laughs> That's not gonna work. Here, let's try this again. <laughs> Are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Oh, great. sorry about that. Um, so uh, here's your average trash day in New York City. I moved to New York when I was uh, in my late teens, and I was pretty astonished by the contrast 
between what I experienced growing up in Hawaii and what your average trash day looked like in New York City. And just, you know, thinking about quantity and scale and what that means. And, you know, New York is just one of, one of these, one of the cities in the world making massive quantities of plastic garbage every day. And I feel like this plastic problem really, it, it has a way of making people feel really powerless. And, um, you know, like there's, there's, there's sort of this empathy that we need to have with each other around that powerlessness. So um, I started playing around back in 2002 and three with bottles and seeing what could be done with them as uh, sculptural components. And at the time I was like, uh, I would say paralyzingly shy. So when I got my first uh, opportunity to exhibit my work um, at an art fair in New York, I actually used some of the budget given to me to pay someone, this, this lovely friend of mine, to, to stand in for me so I didn't have to talk about my work in front of people. But this was an installation um, made out of about 30 sculptures, all using plastic bottles and just seeing what could be done with this material. I think most people don't realize that to date, we've only actually recycled 9% of all the plastics that have been created. So my inspiration for working with this material um, was it became increasingly robust. Um, and also, I think most people don't realize this is that means like if you see nine, 10 bottles, only one of them is actually going to get recycled with the infrastructure that we have. Um, and most people I don't think realize that the main ingredient in all these plastic items is petroleum and it can be extracted um, and reused. So trying to think about, you know, health, uh, not just human health, but the health of the planet and, and how we've all gotten into this situation, especially with water. Um, we all know that microplastics, or most people studying this know that microplastics are pretty much in all the water, including bottled water. And, um, you know, the thing with the polyethylene terephthalate is that it it doesn't biodegrade, it photodegrades. And that takes place when it's exposed to sunlight like you have here. And in those instances, all the chemicals in the plastic go into the water. So we're drinking it. And you know, BPA free is great, but now they've replaced it with something called BPS, which has not been proven to be any safer for any kind of consumption. So I've become kind of obsessed with understanding the chemical compositions of different types of plastics and seeing what their potential is um, and trying to figure out if artists and designers can use some of the same tools that have gotten us into this problem to manipulate this material in a way that it no longer causes this kind of situation, which is happening all over the world. Um, so this is one of the first large scale pieces I made um, for a lobby. It's about 9,000 bottles. And I've been just sort of exploring the potential of this type of material for over a decade now. And thinking about what's happening, you know, in our, in our bodies as a result and in our minds as we, um, as we take in all these chemicals that are not intended for human consumption or any other animals. Um, so my approach is really thinking about how, how to, you know, feel okay being an artist, which everybody has different ways of doing that. But for me, it, it feels more natural to engage in something that is global um, and not just my own personal, what I feel like I'd like to make, but more well, what, what do I feel like people maybe could benefit from seeing um, and not in any kind of way other than like a, a nurturing um, for our own health and well-being. So um, let's see, this was around 2010. It's a piece called Be Like Water. I work a lot with students and different ed educational institutions, um, inter intercepting plastic waste, working with 
different communities is really lovely. Um, this piece has traveled a few different places. It's 80,000 bottle caps, mostly collected by students at schools in Philadelphia. Um, this just shows some of my process uh, for anything larger than an average, I don't know, person's home, maybe. I usually build scale models so that I can imagine what a piece will feel like in a space. Um, this work is using solar powered um, motors and uh, illumination at night. Um, this is, you know, what these kinds of facts that come out or statistics that come out periodically, um, estimating more, more plastic than fish in our oceans by 2050. Um, it's, it's depressing, but it also keeps me focused um, on how to tackle this growing problem. So this is a piece called Plant Perception. It's about 50 feet from tip to tip, made out of a lot of plastic water bottles. Um, these are portraits of my daughters. <laughs> um, and that's just how I've been working for, for quite some time using um, hardware and plastic debris taken from the waste stream. Um, more recently, I've been working a lot with different academic institutions implementing variations on approaches, uh, getting students out in nature to collect material and think about how to use what already exists uh, and is potentially causing problems for the environment um, as a way to sort of liberate uh, young people and have them engaged at the intersection of art and science in really productive and proactive ways. I think a lot of people are under the misconception that this is only affecting fish, but um, we are seeing astonishing quantities of plastic debris in all types of creatures. Um, so Hawaii has come up a bunch. Uh, Pam was mentioning it as well. And it's a lot of these sort of coastal populations uh, that are dealing with the deluge of this material coming from other parts of the world. Um, this is again the southernmost tip of the Big Island, Camilla Point, and this is a, a sculpture made out of material collected from that beach. Um, and doing that piece actually inspired me largely to focus on this idea of Project Vortex. And I've become very interested in seeing what other artists and architects and designers are doing with uh, plastic debris and how we can have a, a bigger voice and a bigger impact by working in harmony and uh, not disparately with um, so many different approaches, but trying to find ways to create synergy around this so that we can become more effective agents of change. Um, this shows a new uh, newer process where I'm now uh, using an uh, injector welder so that I can create larger scale outdoor pieces uh, without any paint and without any added material other than the um, filament for the welders. Um, that's what the tool looks like. It's mostly used by the virgin plastics industry, but now I'm using it for sculptural applications so that I can create larger armatures for objects like this. Um, and it also works for this type of thing. You know, these cleaners, it's, it's really astonishing that it's not illegal to ship things that are more water than anything else and in an oil container the, the fossil fuel industry is having a great time with our cleaning <laughs> cleaning failures. Um, but these, these, tide, these types of high density polyethylene bottles are everywhere um, and they are very easy to work with. Um, as you can see are things like these highway safety barrels. So I'm sort of just in this focusing, I've been focusing on isolating different variables uh, in terms of what types of plastics can be used to achieve what kinds of effects and what their limitations are from a structural standpoint uh, for art and design applications and um, starting to integrate more. But this is also using the injecta welder, um, working with more debris picked up from beaches in Hawaii, yeah, the, whole, the uh, sustainable coastlines. Um, I do a lot of partnerships with conservation groups. This is what the piece, it's outdoor piece of like um, out of welded plastic debris. I left some barnacles on it for fun. Um, <clears throat> more uh, larger scale pieces. This is up um, on exhibition right now at Hollis Taggart Gallery in Manhattan in Chelsea. 
Um, these are outdoor pieces also made out of welded using the injector welder um, industrial plastic debris like the safety drums or barrels, things like that. And it's actually a really easy process. It's easier than metal welding in many ways. Um, and a lot of the same tools transfer over, which is really exciting. Um, and then it also gives the opportunity to create internal light. Um, and that's that really fun aspect of the material. So here's a, a new direction I've been going and working with safety here uh, in keeping with our current climate and needing to think about safety in new ways. Um, this is my old metal welding helmet that I've now started working with an ultrasonic plastic welder um, that is mostly used by the um, medical industry, but it's great for creating uh, little spot welds and it works wonderfully with those cable straps um, and other all manner of chemical compositions. There's a, a safety helmet that was found on the side of the road all broken and I, I welded a variety of things to it. You can see the little dots um, where the welds are. And it's really wonderful because it's indiscriminate as a tool and it works with all thin gauge plastic um, materials. Um, this is a, a sort of sad note to end on. It's called um, Cloudy with a Chance of Plastic. And I made it in response to uh, reading a few articles about scientists discovering um, horrifying quantities of microfiber plastics in the air in the Pyrenees Mountains and in the Arctic. So it's our, our most valuable natural resources, our water, our air, the things that we need and share as living creatures on this planet that are being adversely affected by our careless consumption of plastic. So I'm trying to find ways to change that with as many people as possible. Thank you. Now I'm going to uh, stop sharing and pass it back to Andy. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, Alejandro and Pamela. Those are all amazing presentations. Um, so I'm gonna, I have a, a few questions and I'm coming at it from an artist, you know, point of view, but I think it's something hopefully everybody is interested in. You know, listening to these things, the scale of your work and also the scale of the problem is just um, is mind boggling. Um, and so one of the first things that occurred to me was like, are there moments where it does seem overwhelming or, and if that happens, how do you deal with emotionally, I guess, getting, coming to terms with the scale of the problem? Um, and then connected to that um, is, and this is maybe a little tough, but is, you, is how do you gauge if your work is making a difference? Um, is that something behavioral um, in your audience? Is it opening eyes? Is it affecting policy? So I'd love to know your thoughts about that. Um, Aurora, you're nodding your head. You wanna, you wanna take a swing at it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, I guess the first question, and I think part of why I don't, um, fall into a pit of despair and depression and apathy around this is by virtue of the good fortune that we live in this time. It's like this, this yin yang of dark and light that we're all dealing with all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we live in this time where not only do we have more people than we've ever had, seven and billion and a half, whatever counting, many, many people met much more plastic garbage as a result. But we also have this ability to communicate with one another in ways we've never had before. And therefore we can, I can find inspiration online by, or in, in the world by, by people like you, Pam, Alejandro, find, finding and identifying who else is doing something about this actively and knowing they're out there and checking in as often as I can and finding opportunities where we can work together cohesively. Um, and, and also knowing that, you know, I think that was part of what started Project Vortex was feeling the need to find other sensitives, other artists who are out there who were paying attention, who were fixated on this issue and were, were being proactive. And that, that's incredibly helpful. Great, thanks. I think that's, uh, you know, a motivation for me too, because, uh, you know, 
when I bend over to pick up a piece of plastic, I know that that one piece is not going to choke a bird or tangle a sea turtle or end up in a whale stomach. And so that is huge motivation for me. And, you know, for the millionth time, I'll do that. Um, the other thing is that I have begin to see real change happen. Um, when I started this, I felt I was so alone in it. I actually was camping down at, at um, it's a South Point, you know, at, even by myself sometimes. And, uh, you know, I was just about to prepare to go out again into the field with my tent and whatnot. And uh, I was so like freaked out about it, just like that despair moment that I called a psychic <laughs> in 2006. And, and, and she said, you're just not thinking big enough yet, you know? And, and it was really actually a very good piece of advice because what it made me feel like is like, okay, there's got to be other people that are noticing this and you know sooner or later i did start meeting other people and uh i happened to meet charlie moore the the man that we can all thank for drawing attention to this plastic gyre in the middle of the ocean the you know the north pacific uh subtropical gyre that is responsible for all the plastic we were seeing in hawaii at that point i met him down on that beach and so that was like a huge sign to me that okay, this is right work. This is what I need to do now. Mm -hmm. And I think action actually um, is the best antidote to feeling despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanna reiterate a couple of the things. I mean, I think we're totally aligned. And I mean, for, I've, I've had moments of extreme despair. Like there was one time I was on the beach and I went out and there was like a, a like a, the, the beach is changing shape in Mexico there. And um, there was like, just sort of like a massive puddle that had formed with this sargasso seaweed and oily gookiness. It was just the nastiest I'd ever seen the beach. And I was there by myself and I just let out like what Whitman might call a barbaric yawp. I just like screamed in horror. I was just like, it was just a moment of just letting it out because it was so painful to see the earth just being devastated. It was, it was horrifying, right? But so what, what could I do then? Do I, do I walk away and say, oh, well, or, you know, the thing that keeps me motivated is actually taking action, is actually picking the stuff up, is actually making stuff with the work, is actually with the garbage. And, um, and it feels like it's, it's a process for me of just doing what I can, you know, it's my little part. It's my grain of sand. It's, and, um, and it's been really, uh, motivating as well to see other people, like was already mentioned, just sort of, there's more, there's more of an awareness now. Um, I remember uh, doing an interview 10 years ago, early on in the project and just kind of saying, I don't know if we could ever clean this beach up, you know? And now my goal is to clean the whole reserve. That's like, like my new goal now is to like organize and clean the, the, the whole coast there, you know? And I feel motivated by that now because I mean, the issue has gone more mainstream. You see it in pop culture. You see, you know, you see it on shows filled with millennials. You know, <laughs> you see, you see um, stores popping up, and you see just a real awareness and more more artists. I mean, there is a a group that recently organized, you know, beach cleans and art making all over the world, and just to see more people involved gives me hope. And 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 in terms of your question of impact, that I mean. I don't know if my work has had that impact, but I see change. I see, even though there's plenty of garbage and even during the pandemic, I see more garbage and more, you know, and think new products like disposable masks that are like, oh God, you know, but, but I also do see uh, raised awareness. And so that, that uh, gives me hope and, and motivates and makes me feel like our work, our collective work is making a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that, that sort of leads to another question, which is um, that, that all three of you, you know, are doing these amazing things where you're, you're intervening directly into the, the waste stream. And what I was wondering is, what is it about making artwork out of this waste as opposed to straight up um, waste collection, um, which can be very inspiring, you know, as a community effort or with school kids, but then, um, would you say there's a, um, an increased like impact because it's an art making activity, there's more emotional connection with it? Or what have you seen 
is the difference between your art projects and just straight um, cleanups? I can um, start on that because I really think that this material that, you know, leaves our hands and moves through, um, you know, the waste stream itself through the water vectors that take this ultimately down to the ocean. Uh, along the way, it passes through the lives of lots and lots of other creatures. And so when they, when the, when these materials come back out of the ocean, you know, and I do feel the ocean is saying, pay attention to this stuff. And I've had tremendous, like, crazy experiences with finding things that, uh, you know, are ironic or completely symbolic and metaphoric or sometimes even funny, you know, and so I think the ocean has a sense of humor. I think there is a consciousness to the natural world that is uh, literally attempting to let us know something. And so each one of those objects has a resonant energy to it because it has been changed by these travels. And so that you can't you can't paint that you can't sculpt that it has it it brings it to it and you know every every bite mark from a shark or a sea turtle or the crustacean of um, barnacles and bryozoa that are growing on the the pieces of plastic i think all of that comes back and you know really delivers this information which is that we are not alone in the contact with this material and um you know, it's, it's literally intersecting the lives and sometimes even going through the bodies of these, these other life forms that we share the planet with. And I think that, I think that makes you have pause when you see these things in person, you know, they, they do, they speak out, they are um, resonant objects. Oh, so bring it into public awareness outside the beach cleanup context spreads the message and the art making hooks people into it emotionally or gets eyes on it in a way that wouldn't happen otherwise. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think of it as like future friendly art or, you know, helping people change their taste. You know, it's interesting with COVID changing so many people's ability to taste. Um, even my, my husband can't taste, like his cucumbers taste like bleach now to him. We all had COVID back in March. Mm. Green peppers taste like rotten something horrible. Mm. Like he could, like just just vegetables, you know, <laughs> that normally would be fine. But like, there's something so powerful about desire and preference, and how, you know, if we can cultivate a community and a, a creative identity around utilizing the archival integrity of this material, which is exactly what makes it so bad for the environment. But let's use that for somewhere where it needs where we want archival integrity. We want beautiful things to last in our lives that honor nature and don't harm nature at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think art is is a transformative tool. It's it's an extremely powerful tool. If I had just gone and gathered the garbage up and go gone and brought it to, you know, an ecologically unsound landfill, I wouldn't I don't think I would really be doing so much to change other people's awareness, you know? But, you know, when, when you engage with art, you, you, have, you have a voice. If you're making art, you're empowered, right? You're, 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 you're given a voice. And so I think it's really important to, to you know, like, like to really get, reiterate what Pam said, there's nature is, is speaking to us. The oceans are speaking to us. There's, there are symptoms, you know, COVID I think is a sim symptom. Uh, the wildfires are a symptom. The Sargasso seaweed is a symptom. The plastic is a symptom. All the Mother Earth is just is sharing <laughs> her knowledge with us. And it's time to listen, you know? And in terms of art making, it's a chance for people to then add to that voice or engage with it. You know, when you just stare at an object for a long time, I think, you know, you, you realize that you can realize the power of it. And um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I think art as alchemy is, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Well, um, leading from there, like getting, getting this stuff into, into uh, places where people can see it and interact with it. 
um, a lot of times you're doing these things in extremely beautiful but very remote locations. So um, how do you do you go about um, finding ways to transport, you know, the enormity of these things that you're doing, especially the site specific kind of things? Um, is it is it photographs? Um, is it uh, documentary? Um, and then or transporting that stuff back, you know, and forth? Or what are some of the practical aspects of being this kind of an environmental artist where you're, you're hauling stuff out of the ocean at some, you know, remote location? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a big... I don't pack much myself and I, I uh, bring like double bags and I just pack them full. <laughs> the first time I did that, I was leaving Hawaii, you know, and there's a lot of sensitivity about what comes into and leaves Hawaii, any any island that's remote, I think has that too. But, uh, you know, I had my big duffel bag and, you know, I didn't have time to really sort through it. So there were definitely some, some things that were like pieces of driftwood that were with it too. And, you know, I had to go through TSA and the guy zips it open and he, he looks down in it and then he looks up at me and he goes, thank you for cleaning our island sister, you know? Oh, <laughs> <that's Yeah! good. laughs> I'm so happy <laughs> and I've never had a problem people often do thank me but they they never like try to arrest me or take it away or anything <laughs> contraband <laughs> well I think all of you know you, you how do you bring the message and the materials to the audience I think you know photographs travel on the internet so that's easy but I think bringing the material uh having people see things firsthand is really important mm -hmm. um you know, one of my great friends had been following my project and she knew everything that I was up to. And the, she saw the images coming back and everything. But then she came down to Siankan and came with me and saw firsthand the garbage on the beach. And it was just like a cathartic moment where she just was started to cry because it was like, she's like, I know what you've been up to, but this is different seeing it firsthand. You know, I think it's really important to see things firsthand. Um, one idea that I'm working on right now is creating a virtual, a virtual museum in the jungle. You know, so people can't necessarily come down to Siankan. It's a, you know, it's a trip. It's a journey, not just to via air, but in the car, and it's a long jungle road. Um, and I think it's important to come see it. But I also would like to be able to bring it to people who can't travel right now. So I think any and all of the above tools to get the message out are really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I was just also wondering about, like, in, in the process of doing that, it, I'm, I'm guessing that some of this stuff started off just like you on your own, out of your own, like, artistic impulses, but now you're working at a scale that's, like, really large, and what are some of the, what are some of the, like, how do you make these large projects happen? Are they self-funded? Is it, like, Cristo and Jean-Claude doing these enormous outdoor projects? Um, he funded his projects with, um, as, as you all know, um, his own collages and drawings. And then there was just scores and scores of volunteers, you know, doing these things. Um, but um, there's a real, you know, there's, there's a cost to doing these kind of large scale things. Um, and I'm sure there are some volunteer things, but what are some of the, like some of those practical aspects of, of carrying off these, these huge projects? I make paintings also, and actually um, that really uh, has helped me fund some of my big projects. And um, um, I did get one very large uh, art award, which mm -hmm. I'm still able to, um, I still have some left from that. So that was um, almost five years ago now. And um, I, I think, you know, I, it, it's probably, rare. I mean, I think Aurora would be the one to really answer because I think she's probably had the most uh, public large scale commissions um, that are really large. Like I couldn't believe the scale of some of those things. I saw that one that was your first one in the glass uh, gallery. I saw that um, way back, you know, that was early, I think like 2010, 10 maybe or something. Yeah, it was 2007 or eight. Yeah, yeah, that was a funny situation because there was a hurricane, Hurricane Ike happened in the middle of that one. And there's a video of, and you know, it was like 
we were completely um, sleeping on the floor of the gallery with my baby and trying to install riveting with one hand holding a baby. It was oh my like, gosh. you know, it was kind of crazy. There was no power, no running water. We were evacuated from the hotel. It was like just trees down everywhere during the install. It was really funny. And, and I was nursing, so I had to drink from a water bottle because there was no running water. And there was some video of, of me drinking from a water bottle and I got hate mail, people calling me a hypocrite. I was like, oh no, I just, okay. <laughs> I mean, you kind of can't win, but, it, but it's maybe it's not about winning. Um, that, that, every project for me is different. I mean, radically, you know, sometimes I'll have a fantastic budget and a huge support team to work with or be able to hire a lot of other artists, which is something that makes me really, really happy when I'm able to, you know, feed other sensitives. Um, to do things uh, and, and do the good work. Because I think we all know from pursuing this kind of work for as long as we have, that the more you do it, that more satisfying it becomes because you get better at it just like anything else. And so now it's like my, my taste buds for art supplies are very specific to waste materials. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't crave going to some high-end art supply store or working with bronze or anything like that. I'm very excited about what can be done with what's here and is causing a problem. Um, but it does lead to a lot of logistical issues in terms of storage, in terms of, you know, I don't ever want to try to recycle this stuff. I, you know, I try to honor all the labor and time and effort and energy that goes into it. So, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a logistical challenge. Um, some projects don't have much of a budget um, and it's always different. So just trying to, um, you know, remember that it's it's matter, so it matters. It, as much as we might have been told it didn't at any point in our lives, we have to say, yeah, I'm, and making, doing anything with this is keeping it out of the problem. You know, intercepting it before it gets into the ocean is the best in a way, because then we're turning off the tap. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we can keep cleaning the same beach over and over again. Yeah. I really do think that that's where we need to go from here. I think in some way we all have the cleaner ethic because um, it's caretaking. I think, you know, we're literally taking care of our planet. And that's how I feel when I do that. I'm trying to also make amends, you know, for every piece of plastic that I've used before I was aware. Um, and but the thing is, we can't recycle our way out of this. We can't um, clean our way out of this. We've got to just stop it. And I really want, if possible, my work to um, raise call, you know, be like a call to action, raise the alarm bells that this is a problem. You know, we've got to stop. We've got to change our behavior. We have alternatives. We know how to do this. We've done this before better with other things, glass, metal. Uh, bamboo, you know, and, and we've got to kind of relearn, uh, you know, a connection to the natural world. And, and I think that's what all of us have in common that, you know, we understand that implicitly because of our deep contact with this unnatural, undigestible material. Yeah, just to, to follow up on that. I mean, my project has been from the beginning, it was it was self-funded. I would work. I, I I do video production, and I'm all, I've also been an educator. And I would save up my money, and go on a trip and go work on the project. And whenever I could save up a little bit more, I would go work on the project. And so I'm kind of the, not the right person to ask in terms of figuring out how to figure out how to figure out the financial puzzle, um, because I went deep into debt for for this problem, for, because I had no choice. I like this project arose. I dropped, every, I had other projects. I had other photo series. I cleared out my website and said, this is it. This is my life. I want to, I, I, if I die, this is, you know, this is what I want to be remembered for. And I went into debt on this project. Um, and I've never been a good salesman and I didn't care. <laughs> I was like, I need to do this. Um, it didn't hurt that I was in the Caribbean in a paradise. I was like, all right, I got to get back there. But it was it was a real mission, and and that mission continues. And um, and there were times that I was ready to give up, and um, you know, and I pushed through and took took uh, took risks to continue the work. And then and like Pam, I received a, a grant uh, from Creative Capital, which is a wonderful organization, and that 
was like, oh, I can keep doing this. Oh, people value this. And it's, it's kind of pushed me ahead. And so I don't have the puzzle figured out yet, but um, I think as artists, there are multiple streams that we have to use. You know, there's potential speaking engagements, there's teaching positions, there's artwork sales, there's, you know, there's, there, I think as artists, we have, to, we have to think about multiple income streams. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I, I sell photographs and I'm looking, I just invested in, in, a, in a large printer. It was like a big move for me, a 44 inch printer just recently. So I'm very excited about that. And I wanna make this project sustainable. I wanna power it more. There's, there's a lot of work to do. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so you just gotta, sometimes if you, know, if you have faith in something, you gotta kind of go out on a limb and yeah, just and keep we, pushing it. You touched upon something really important, which is the diversifying of income streams, especially for artists, but I think this applies to everybody. And I think that it's really also, you know, if you think about what we're doing, we're leveling these false hierarchies by doing the work that we're doing, right? Somebody somewhere thought, oh, plastic is garbage. It's disposable. We all know it's exactly the opposite. There's nothing disposable about it. But, you know, so, so here we are taking something that's this base material that everybody thinks of so poorly. You know, how dare we make such judgments when we're so lucky to have any of this? This living on earth is such a gift. So, so what we're doing in our studios and in our practice is creating this balance mm -hmm. in like our internal balance. So I try to apply that to diversifying income streams by thinking of, okay, I'm going to make tiny little things that take me just a few hours out of a few pieces of, and those are like very affordable and then I'll make massive things. So it can be, you know, you don't, you don't judge the scale. Right. You don't judge the material and you just do the action. Actually, I think, I, um, sorry, I just want to follow up on one little thing that 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 Pam said as well, because she you talked. I think it's very important. We have technology to do so many things. We just landed on Mars today. Like <laughs> Elon Musk is the richest man in the world right now, and he wants to go populate Mars and, you know, you know, save our species by being an interplanetary species. Um, what if we focus that, what if we focus some of those resources on fixing this plastic pollution problem? We could do it like that. We, I mean, the, you know, I, I, I got into drones a while. Drone technology is, is fascinating. It's amazing. You can have this thing fly around and go all over the place. GPS. I mean, I'm not even going to get into all the details. We have technology. It's just a question of the, the interest and the prioritization of these issues you know i don't have all the answers but i know that technology can solve this issue so it's i think we gotta we gotta push for people who have power and resources to make these changes i think that i couldn't agree more and and also um something that aurora said i think is really important um which is that you're taking something and by making an artwork out of it you're making something that people think of um the sort of uh, reflex of thought is that it is trash, but you're making, transforming it into something that's quite beautiful. And, um, and I just, I think that is sort of meta, a good metaphor for how it's necessary to shift the kind of thinking about this issue um, and uh, changing, changing the perspective of how we look toward this trash. And, um, and uh, I think it's amazing, you know, to see and very inspiring, you know, about how each of you are doing this in your own way. And it's equally amazing that you haven't met in person yet, but um, I'm sure it's just a matter of time. But um, this I think- This will be the year. <laughs> yeah, this will be, this is a good New Year's. It's not too late to make New Year's resolutions. Um, <laughs> but um, I, think, uh, I think we're at that point now where we go to the Q and A if uh, Danny, you're listening and wanna, wanna make that transition. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm listening like totally transfixed, uh, feeling profoundly grateful to all of you um, for being here tonight and for sharing, uh, you know, sharing with us uh, about your work and, and also having this conversation um, and also just in general, the, the work you're doing. So, so grateful to you and what, um, what a hopeful and inspiring and it, as well as just informative and interesting conversation. 
I can't thank you enough. And we have a, a number of people who have queued up questions in the in the Q and A here, so I want to get to those in just a minute. Um, and and I I want to invite everyone. I think so. We have the Q and A button that you can use. And um, if you're good with typing your question in that way, I'm going to suggest you do that. If for some reason you really prefer to use the raise hand button and have us try to unmute you and you ask your question yourself, we can try that as well. But we've, we've had some glitchiness with that. So if you're good with typing your question in, um, let, let's go that way. Um, and so before I start um, sharing some of the questions with you, I just want to say how much I appreciate this thing you said, Pam, that action is the best antidote, antidote to despair. Um, I, you know, that is just so, that's so, it's so helpful to be reminded of that. And I loved Alejandro, what you were saying about art as alchemy, having this really, this special power and being so important. And Aurora, your concept of future friendly art. I mean, I think that's like such perfect that, seems like such a perfect description of your work and, um, and just a wonderful concept. So, I mean, I've just, I've been appreciating this so much and uh, have my own questions, but uh, let's, let's first get to the audience questions and, uh, and then see if we still have any time for mine. Um, so a few people actually typed some things in the chat. Uh, Stephen Meyer wrote, these installations need to be in public spaces to gain awareness. I'm an industrial designer and was an ID major in college. Any ID major that sees this art will reconsider what they design in the future, install them at universities, airports, and public spaces, include the vital statistics. How can this be accomplished? Anyone want to respond to that? I love that he's considering, um, you know, the design aspect of it, because that's what a lot of people are, that's part of the conversation in the plastic activist community is, uh, it's a design problem. And we really have, you know, sort of done ourselves and the, the world a disservice by making this material that, you know, doesn't go anywhere. So we do have to redesign um, how we make things. And, and, you know, this idea of the disposable single use, that's just got to go away. Nothing in nature is only used once. And I think, you know, we've, you know, we have this sort of hubristic, uh, you know, idea that we can do it better and we can make it and we, we're sort of remaking the world in plastic. And I think that that's another um, part of it. We don't need to keep having new things. There's plenty of things already. And so, you know, I think all of us consider our practices um, a form of like creative reuse. I, I don't even want to say recycling because I think recycling is a lie. It's really like we've been fooled by the um, chemical companies that, you know, recycling is going to be the, you know, the solution. It is not, it's, it doesn't really happen. Most of the time it's not really happening. And so we have to just change the whole thinking about plastic. And, and um, I think the mm. redesign aspect from an industrial design standpoint is right on. Thank you, Pam. Stephanie writes, thank you to all of you for bringing this trash to us in such an inspiring and beautiful way. And that's actually Stephanie and Maisie, who's 13 years old. Thank you, Stephanie for, and Maisie. And um, Abby and others uh, were like expressing their virtual agreement, expressing their agreement virtually with um, the point, Alejandro, that you were making about Elon Musk and like the resources are there. Like if we can solve these other problems and then, then we can, you know, divert some resources or utilize resources to solve this problem as well. Abby and others um, chimed in to say exactly key point. Um, I'm going to, let's, let's get up to some more questions here. Joshua asks, how can your work be used to prevent plastic pollution from the source, not only intercepting it by cleaning efforts? Are you all looking to collaborate with organizers to demand public policy 
that addresses this issue at a systemic level. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm trying to get a hold of someone at P&G. <laughs> if anyone knows anyone, um, because I keep thinking about, um, you know, if this technology exists to reduce, like if say we didn't say, I'm sure many of you know about laundry detergent strips, right? As opposed to the bottles of laundry detergent, that is a great product. That is technology that exists. Imagine if all the Tide and all the gain and all the, like all these different types of detergents that we use were instead forced to use this technology and how much less packaging and plastic and water and fossil fuels, I mean, it would just be a huge impact. So, so that's something I'm kind of focusing on right now is how to you know, start um, engaging in these kinds of dialogues in a way that I, I don't find it very effective to um, blame or like, it, you, you know what I mean? We're all, most people are caught up in the tyranny of the moment and they're just trying to figure out how to pay their mortgages and you know, stay afloat uh, and caught up in whatever it is they're doing. Autopilots are very hard to get out of their habits. So, um, so that, that's the kind of uh, high level policy engagement I'm really interested in is trying to figure out how to get um, like, you know, diff different um, toothpaste, for example, terrible, hard to recycle, impossible to recycle for the most part because it's mixed chemicals. Um, a lot of these types of products could be replaced with bites or like the tablets for brushing your teeth. So there's zero plastic involved. Um, so, so that's something I'm, I'm very interested in if anybody has context. This is like PNG that own Tide, that own Crest, that own Colgate, the vast majority of these products that everybody's consuming. Unilever. So, Unilever, exactly. Unilever. We work with politicians, actually. Um, you know, I, I, we've got a statewide um, group now that's that's starting to uh, really push, and you know, this has even been since 2015 um, for uh, plastic bag bans, like. The city of Atlanta, um, Tybee Island actually got so close to passing one, and you know, then you really realize like what you're up against because the oil lobby is the plastic lobby. They're all in it together, and in fact, you know, with the pandemic and people not traveling for an entire year, uh, the the um, oil companies decided that they were actually going to shift into making more plastic so that they could keep their uh, you know wheels turning, I guess. And, um, you know, they were actually targeting African countries, um, you know, that they were going to sell this to. And you can look, look it up in the New York Times. There was an article about three or four months ago. But the, uh, the, the thing is, I think um, there's a ripeness right now at this moment. And I think people can go to their city councilmen, they can go to the mayors of, you know, the towns or cities you live in. Um, and just ask for a meeting and, and you know, you can actually write legislation as a citizen. And um, I'm, I'm learning this through working with people in Oceana and, um, and Plastic Pollution Coalition. And, you know, there, there are ways that citizens have a very loud voice. And I think that's another thing. Um, I can't remember who was talking about it on our group, but something about how you feel disempowered um, in the face of plastic, but, you know, really, Every time you buy something, you're voting with your purchase. You know, you're voting with your dollar, and um, I, you know, companies are starting to hear that because people are not buying and going for it anymore. And I think that's the that's the next step is like just having the the revolt <laughs> by the populace, um, and and then letting the politicians know that we just don't want it anymore. Yeah, and I, I would just add that I think there's a, a larger issue at work here. And, and I don't know what the answer is, but I think that if you are struggling to find basics, basic necessities for life, housing, food, clean water, mm -hmm. the, the plastic pollution issue is really not a priority for you. You know, thinking about mm -hmm. others when you don't have your basic necessity, basic needs met. Mm -hmm. is a major issue. And so, you know, I find that's why, you know, documenting where the garbage is coming from on a global scale 
is a big part of my project. You know, I want to, where is this coming from? Like, let's look at, you know, the source of this. And I find that it is that there, there's a lot from countries that are, that are poor, that don't have basic, you know, you know, even beyond food and water, water and housing, like garbage uh, disposal services. So if you don't have any place to put your garbage, where's your garbage going? Your garbage is going on the street, which goes to a river, which goes to the ocean. And so there are larger issues of global inequity and global poverty that really need to be addressed. So it's, I think it's all related. I don't think it's just a focus on, on plastic. It's, there's larger issues at work. Absolutely. I, I really, really appreciate that point. And um, I also want to feel like as true as that is, um, there's also tons of value, as you were saying it earlier, in just doing what you can. You pick up this one piece of plastic and that's one piece that's not gonna, that a bird's not gonna ingest. And um, so important to be mindful of the enormity of the problem and the interrelatedness of, of the problem, but not let that make you feel hopeless about the, the value of doing what you can do. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't want to overwhelm everyone. Yeah, with the, like, yeah no, 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 no. I think you're, no. you're totally right, and that's why we do what we do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have some more questions and comments and thoughts here. Um, and this one is from Catherine Stowe, a wonderful curator. Um, she says, thank you all so much, and hi, Aurora. I'm wondering... Whoops, it just jumped on my screen. I'm wondering why we can't get the chemical industry to offer interesting art residencies to artists like you all so you can collaborate on innovative solutions. CERN in Switzerland has one around particle physics. NASA has one around space. What do you think? I love this idea. <laughs> I just thumbed it up. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine why not, you know. This is probably the lowest hanging fruit of all of our environmental problems. You know, like this is just cleaning up our room. It's not that complicated, but it does require, it, like we need to make it easy for people to do what's best for them and all the other creatures. Right. And right now, the way it's set up is it's hard for people, especially who don't have access to your fancy, you know, like just products that are sold to middle aged, upper middle class women who want to have small footprints. Like, that's lovely. That's fantastic. I'm we're glad these products exist. But the, this balancing that we do in our studios needs to be applied on a larger scale in terms of accessibility, and equity and a responsibility, you know? Like, I feel like we're creating some kind of metaphor in our studios or model in our studios by, by saying, you know, I, I'm just not gonna do that. I'm just gonna say, no, I'm just gonna refuse. <laughs> I'm just gonna refuse myself, like re refuse my wiring. And in so doing, we're changing ourselves. Like, I don't know if I could say the same for, like, I don't know if you would say the same thing, Alejandro and Pamela, but I, for me, I didn't start with the plastic degree thinking, I'm gonna go be an environmentally conscious artist. I was just curious about it as a material. And, and that made me realize that most people don't know what's in it, but we are so intimate with it. And why do we have this implicit trust in something we know so little about as a society, we're just accepting carelessness. Andy, I have a question for you. Yeah. You, uh, you do so much work with found objects, the everyday objects. Right. Uh, is this, are the issues we're, we're, that we're really focusing on tonight, have, the, have they figured prominently in your thinking in, in the past? Do you, think they, um, do you think they might in the future? I do think I do think they relate. Um, it really came to the forefront with the sneakers, but um, the, I think the reason I did connect with found objects a lot is because of how much power they have, because of um, their prior lives, and the way they're instantly relatable, and how they they like they bring a message with them, like a message in a bottle, 
So they actually, sometimes the challenging thing is, um, is directing that and controlling it so that you can actually make some kind of artistic statement with it rather than just presenting these things as fascinating objects on their own um, because they're so loaded or, or sometimes just a material um, has these characteristics that are, um, that are really are really loaded like, um, like I used uh, tobacco leaves, you know, for example, um, or licorice. Um, but the found objects, it's just that narrative power they have. And with the sneakers, there's that brand recognition. There's that, um, that sort of you're playing on the memories of people, you know, that have used these products. And, and then there's that aspect of like what Alejandro was saying with the alchemy, because you're taking something that is, was garbage, was, you know, in the recycling bin or out on the street or somebody just didn't want anymore. And you're turning like lead into gold. Um, and making it to an art object and giving it a, a new life. So it's sort of endlessly fascinating and it makes me want to do more of it. <laughs> it's addictive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, on the point that uh, Aurora was making earlier, talking about industry, uh, Abby writes in the chat, exactly, requires leadership and systems level change in manufacturing slash distribution. And living without plastics is within our living memory. Remember the graduate? We have lived for only 50 plus years with widespread plastics. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Kristen writes, Alejandro and Pam both talked about projects that people could get involved with. Would you be able to reiterate what those projects are and what possibilities there might be for engagement? And I would add that Aurora, if you have if you have something you want to add to that as well, please do. But Alejandro and Pam, do, if you could sure, reiterate yeah. how people could get involved. Well, well, one thing I'm working on now, it's not not ready yet, is um, is a curriculum, is uh, a gift, not something I would charge for, that I would just make available to schools and youth groups who want to get involved with potentially organizing beach cleans and making art with plastic pollution. So that's that's one thing that I haven't launched yet, but I would like to. Um, so that's one way to get involved. Um, in, and, you know, come come to Mexico, come join me on this <laughs> on this journey um, and help me build this this museum. I mean, I, I I need all kinds of collaborators. I'm trying to make this virtual museum. I need I, I need uh, cinematographers and filmmakers. I need help. So, um, but but yeah, the curriculum is something that I'm hoping, you know, you don't need to come to me and you don't need to help me with my mission, with our mission here, but that you could, um, you could take to your local community and work with. Alejandro, let me know when you have it. I would love to share it. Yes, for sure. Well, I have, um an extremely large archive of objects that I've been collecting again since 2005. And at some point along the way, people started sending me things. And um, so that's kind of how the idea uh, developed for this um, book project that I'm working on. And I, I want this to be uh, sort of a two pronged thing. I'd love for this to go out in the world in some way and create a kind of army of of, of people that are looking and paying attention and cleaning and picking up things, but then also are using their own powers of uh, creativity and suggestion and invention to uh, decide how, what that message might be for that from that object. You know, what what is it telling you? It's I do think they're speaking to us. And so uh, if you anyone that's within earshot of this um, would like to start looking around for things that come to you as a message please get in contact with me you can send just a photograph of it i'm going to be um collecting those and we're going to have a digital archive for one thing but then um the ones that are selected for the book will will actually contain the uh collector's name the location any kind of notes that they want to add about it and so um you know the idea is that um you know this 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 world ocean is speaking to us so what is it saying to you that's what i'd like to know 
I have a, a few ideas on, on what people can do. Um, and one ties in Great. with Alejandro is um, on projectvortex.org, I'm trying to compile curricula from as many artists who are working with plastic debris or designers or architects as possible so that different academic institutions around the world can find one that works for them. And maybe even partner with a local artist who does that, you know, and just to help implement this kind of thing, because any way okay. people can engage in actually touching the material, having this tactile experience with it and feeling the resonance, the past, the history, all, all of that, and, and seeing how it's impacting our environment is, is huge because education will change behavior. Um, the other thing is supporting artists who are doing this kind of work. Um, uh, I get emails from people saying, so do you ever sell your work? <laughs> and, and, you know, it's kind of funny to me that people think, oh, I'm just, you know, I can afford to just make giant installations and, you know, the bread comes in through the door somehow <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, so it's always beautiful to support artists and, you know, think about, well, do I need that print or that painting or, or could I buy something that's made out of debris? that somebody's mm. trying to do something uh, a little bit different with. Um, and then the other thing is working or supporting conservation groups who are doing these cleanups in your vicinity. It's huge. Um, I think that's a really beautiful way to spend a day and it's outside and it's safe for social distancing. So. Great I'm amazed how suggestions, how thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say how how I feel really great ever, even in uh, just picking up one thing, you know, it, it actually gives me a little bit of a little endorphin boost, you know, and uh, <laughs> really does like the group. Yeah. Actually, it, if you think about it as, um, you know, that you're actually, you know, a detective in search of clues, not just a janitor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something really powerful and it is empowering and you can be the translator of, you know, this larger um, entity of the natural world, which is is crying out for us to to listen to her. So, yeah, and to, and to follow up on that, I mean, and kind of to go back to the point about um, art as alchemy. Um, I think we have to rethink the the way we we view plastic. I, it's very easy to fall into in in our world that we're all in here to be like, I hate plastic. Plastic is the devil. It's the devil's resin. It's the root of all evil. But um, but that's not, the devil's resin is not my quote. That's from, uh, I think, Susan Frankel's book. But um, the, the, what, if we, what if we were to alchemize our thinking on that and say, what if we loved plastic? Now, obviously we don't love plastic killing animals, but what if we loved it enough to care for it, to make sure it didn't end up being garbage out of place as burning man burners say, you know, gop, garbage out of place. That's the real evil, right? Because plastic has, you know, we're using plastic to communicate right now. We got plastic in our headphones and plastic in our computers, but that's not being thrown into the ocean, you know? So there are good uses of plastic. There are medical uses of plastic. You know, it's, it's about how we use this material that is, I think, really important. And if we were to love it a little more, um, then and not be like, I got to repel it and oh, I got to get rid of it. And oh, I drank that water out of that water bottle. I feel guilty, but let me throw it away because it makes me feel guilty. Like what if, oh, let me care for this. Well, can I either turn this into or make sure it ends up in a place that it, it is handled appropriately? I think that's part of um, a way we can rethink and, you know, and alchemize this situation, you know? But I just want to add, please don't drink water out of a plastic bottle if you have any choice. Even a, re a regular fountain is better because you are getting chemicals in there. It's it's leaching in and, you know, that's what they don't want us to know. And, um, you know, you can wash out a pickle jar, mayonnaise jar or something uh, and just use that for your water bottle. I mean, I, I do that often if I don't have something with me. So um, the first thing I did, the first thing I did was buy a water bottle. I started this project i was like oh i need to get a water bottle and so that's the number one thing we didn't need to drink water stay hydrated and don't <laughs> don't don't buy don't buy the man's plastic yeah as soon as you stop drinking plastic water if you if you ever have to like in a desperate situation if you can taste it you can taste like the leaching chemicals it's 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 really bad um you 
I have so many notes of thanks and gratitude coming in, and I will share those. Um, I also have people saying, oh, I have to hop off to a, another thing. So I'm going to I have a few more questions here. I want to I want to honor those and get to those, but I'm going to start uh, winding it down. So if anyone who, out there in the audience still ha has burning questions or comments, please um, think about getting them in now. Uh, Serenity writes, thank you for your activist art and this engaging and articulate conversation. You're doing important and valuable work as artists. Can you offer your top suggestions for how we might make a change in our everyday personal actions? Well, I, I feel like we've just heard one or two. Uh, what about as a community, are, are things like plastic bag bans, push against disposable coffee cups, requiring reusable water bottles are those effective? Maybe if anyone just quickly has a thought about, about those kinds of community regulatory initiatives. I think even at schools, you know, if they have a lunch program, a lot of them are still using styrofoam. It is a terrible substance, especially for hot material like food. Um, and so you can get the kids motivated uh, it's happened at a couple different schools here in Atlanta that I've spoken at. Um, somebody takes it on them and the kids are usually the ones that start it and they start making noise to their parents and the, and the principal and, and pretty soon they're getting rid of it in their cafeterias. So I think there's, I think there's, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of room. And I think, you know, young people, I think are really, really in tune with this and they can do so much, um, to make change like that, you know, in, in their lives and in everybody's life. Thank you. Speaking of young people, Joanne writes, each of you connected students or connected with students, maybe connected as students or youth in some way. What do you think this teaches students and youth and what have students and youth opened your eyes to during your endeavor? Alejandro, you shared those really touching pictures of those kids with their messages. Yeah. Um, can, re can you repeat the question one more time? I want to get, make sure I answer that. Yeah. What, what do you think your work teaches young people and what have young people opened your eyes to in your work? I think is what that question boils down to. Yeah, I mean, for me, working with, with the youth is, is, is extremely inspiring and, and they, they teach me things every day. I mean, thinking like a kid is the way to be. As an artist, you need to have an open mind. You need to see the world with fresh eyes. And, you know, I find that sometimes, for example, working in the community with, with youth, you know, parents are maybe already set in their ways. But you, you, if, if, you light, if you light up a, a child's mind with new ideas, they're teaching their parents. And that is something that I've heard is that, that, um, that that's a way in to change change sort of an older more rigid generation potentially is through through youth so i think that's that's really important but but like i said i mean kids mind is an artist's mind you know so i, I love working with kids pam or, or aurora any comments about that or thoughts about yeah how kids okay. have, have impacted your work or how you think your work impacts kids well I mean, for me, kids seem like they get it more than most people because it's so obvious, you know, but I think most people just don't, aren't looking down. They're not as close to the ground, maybe, so they don't notice all the bottle caps and all the wrappers and all the stuff that's just collecting. Plus, the majority of kids' toys these days are made out of plastic. So they spend a lot of time in very close proximity to these toxic chemicals, basically. Um, and they're, you know, when they become aware, like you have to be really careful in terms of how you present it to young people because you don't want to overwhelm them or have them feel like they've inherited a problem. And, you know, then they feel apathetic and afraid and it becomes like, too much, you know, and that's not really fair. So trying to figure out ways and, and kids seem to do this all the time, like you, you, you put them out in nature and then they find the things that don't belong in nature. And then they do something with it. Like what Pam was saying earlier, it becomes more of a treasure hunt, looking for cool, weird plastic objects in a stream. 
as opposed to you know thinking of it as garbage and depressing. So the, the experiences I've had working with kids in academic institutions making things out of plastic debris is like so liberated. They're always, it's, it's like taking away the, the, um, the blank canvas syndrome, any intimidation in the, the art making mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. is gone because you can't make the garbage worse than it is. So right. they're like seeing young people excited and liberated and being active agents of change with their hands like that is very, it's mind blowing. And, and that's, that's the, the, like going back to the well in a way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Catherine writes, thank you all for such a fabulous, inspiring panel. So much great information and wonderful to see you and your work. Much gratitude to everyone. Wendy writes, thank you for a great panel. Very thought provoking and inspiring. Um, and whoops, I kind of lost my, the chat window for a second here. Um, Stacy writes, I'm so inspired to hear you all tonight. I had seen the plastic entanglement exhibit at Smith College a few years ago, and I'm excited to get to hear you speak about your work. And then Stacy um, goes on to explain that she works with an organization called the Connecticut River Conservancy, and she helps organize a large annual cleanup and is extending an invitation to all of you, and I believe to anyone else who would like to get involved. And they, she says they've worked with artists in the past. And so I will share Stacy's contact information with you afterwards in case you would like to follow up with her about that. Thank you for that offer, Stacy. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Um, let me just come back to my, my notes. Um, yeah, I, Pam, Alejandro, Aurora, Andy, uh, I really can't thank you enough for, for doing this. And Andy, you know, this turns out to be a totally additional and unexpected gift of having your work and uh, this amazing project that you've done being connected with that at the Brattleboro Museum. This is uh, just one more uh, amazing byproduct of that. So thank you, Andy, for kind of being the, the uh, like motivating force behind this. And Pam, Alejandro, Aurora, so generous of you to, to do this tonight and be part of this discussion and answer and answer our questions. Um, before we sign off, I just want to let everyone know that a recording of this event tonight will be available on the museum's website within the next day or two. That's brattleboromuseum.org. If you'd like to share it, you'll find it. You go to events and then video archive, and uh, there will be a recording there. And please feel free to share that. While you're there on our website, you can take a virtual tour of Andy's exhibit. Uh, better still, if you're in the Brattleboro area between now and March 6th, you can stop into the museum and see Andy's exhibit and our other exhibits in person. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 4. And last thing I would, I would say is that if you enjoyed this event tonight and would consider making a donation to support this type of free programming through the museum, we would be very grateful for that. Uh, any, any amount makes a big difference, and that's also something you can do at our website, brattleboromuseum.org. And you know what, if you're inclined and inspired to instead or in addition to support any of the wonderful projects that, that Pam and Alejandro and Aurora have mentioned and that they're involved with, I think that would be really great too. Um, so thank you all again. Uh, stay safe and uh, take good care of yourselves, all of you, and take good care of each other and hope to see you in person sometime soon. Thank you so much. Good night. It was really a wonderful panel. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. What a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.